All right, welcome. This is the last talk of the day. Thank you for all, all for sticking around. So this is uh, Cryptography Pitfalls. My name is John Downey, uh, as you can see up on the slide. Uh, so I wanted to first uh, frame this up with some context. Why do I want to talk to you about cryptography pitfalls? Uh, and par part of it is, I, whenever I v you know, visit with developers, um, you know, I am a developer, I am on a team of developers, but I often see we're making a lot of the same mistakes over and over. We're building these crypto into these systems and we're just, we're really bad at it and it's causing kind of some of the same failures to re reappear over and over. Uh, so this is really a cautionary tale. Uh, I personally love hearing stories of failure. I love trying to learn from stories of failure. Uh, and I wanted to ground this in real events. So I tried to uh, tie into like real research, cite real papers, uh, real events in the news, uh, and kind of present that to you. Uh, because my goal is for you to take this back and go back and go, okay, am I in over my head? Do I need to get professional help? Do I need to seek a consultancy uh, to kind of help with these systems? Because all these folks who ostensibly should have known better have made these mistakes while implementing crypto in their systems. All right. Uh, so a little bit about me real quick. Uh, I work for Braintree. Uh, if you're not familiar, Braintree is a company that helps businesses accept payments. Uh, business, you know, companies like Uber, Airbnb, and uh, GitHub, uh, which I'm sure folks in here are familiar with at least one of those. Uh, so at Braintree, obviously we have a very, uh, you know, concrete interest in cryptography and security. Uh, and so I do security at Braintree. Uh, you may not also know Braintree was founded here in Chicago. Uh, the founder was a graduate of the Booth School. Uh, and so I, my team's here, I'm here in Chicago, and I'm very happy to be speaking at GoToChicago. Uh, another thing you, you may or may not know about Braintree is Braintree was acquired by PayPal uh, a little over two and a half years ago. Uh, so we're now part of PayPal, and if you've ever worked for a publicly traded company, you'll recognize this statement. Uh, the views are expressed in this presentation are my own. They do not reflect PayPal. So now that that's out of the way. I kind of wanted to start with a modern uh, overview of like what, what modern crypto means. Uh, and we can talk about some common misses along the way uh, and then you know, kind of go from there. So in cryptography, we, in the modern sense, we have three needs. Uh, the first one is confidentiality. Uh, this is about keeping messages secret. Uh, generally, what you think of when someone says cri crypto, you think of like, no one else can read this message. This is like the using encryption. Uh, in authentication, uh, this is also called integrity protection. This is making sure that if I send a message, that the receiver can validate that it hasn't been changed. And then the last one is identification. This is knowing who sent the message. Um, these days, we often see this combined with the previous one, authentication, in the form of digital signatures. So uh, John sent this message, and it hasn't been modified since John sent it. Cryptography, uh, modern cryptography is a very rigorous science. Uh, it's based on, some of it is based on very hard math problems, uh, and these math problems are largely considered hard, at least the ones that we use, day-to-day uh, -day are considered hard on what are called classical computers. Uh, that's read non-quantum computers. So there's a whole new field of study on like what are we going to do uh, when we inevitably do design practical quantum computers that is totally out of scope for this. Uh, but for example, one of, the one of the math problems we rely on day in, day out uh, for our digital communication, especially in e-commerce, is uh, how do we factor large numbers into their base primes? Uh, and this is the, this is the science behind our, the RSA algorithm. And what we're really doing with crypto these days is we're betting that there are no major advancements in either math or computers, at least for as long as we want to keep the data secret. So uh, like any science, crypto uh, should be peer reviewed. Uh, this, I feel like uh, the security community has been able to kind of successfully beat into folks' heads, like don't design your own crypto. So that mantra has really taken hold. I'm very happy about that. Uh, but this also should be extended with like don't implement your own. Uh, so you know, sometimes you would see folks take like 
oh, well, I didn't, I didn't design the RSA, but I went and I implemented it, and you know, you then are stumbling downstairs very quickly. Uh, so, included with the peer review uh, is the kind of the statement of you. The only thing in the system that you want to be able, to, you want to have to keep secret is the key. So this is something called Kirchhoff's principle. Uh, you can, will sometimes hear called security through obscurity or not doing security through obscurity. So uh, I should be able to give an attacker a layout of the design of my system, but not give them the keys and the system should remain secure. That's, that's the goal here. And while cryptography itself is very strong, uh, the individual primitives uh, are often very, you know, can be, or the individual primitives are very strong, but when they're combined, they can sometimes be very weak. Um, would it be possible to get these lights turned down uh, so that way there's, the, that way this will show up better? The, I don't know, nope. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so, uh, systems, uh, when they're built with cryptography, uh, it's this composition that will sometimes, you know, kind of bite you. Uh, and when they're, you know, the primitives can be misused. And the missteps here are catastrophic. Uh, you know, your, this one small misstep means your entire system's insecure, even though the other parts of it may have been used correctly. So uh, I really like this, uh, this uh, quote, which I'll read to you real quickly. Uh, there uh, is a book, Cryptography Engineering, and uh, th you know, the quote is, you've probably seen the door to a bank vault, at least in the movies. You know, 10 inch thick hardened steel with huge bolts to lock it in place. It certainly looks impressive. We often find the digital equivalent of such a vault door installed in a tent. People standing around it are arguing over how thick the door should be, rather than spending their time looking at the tent. Uh, so what I take away from this is, you know, you'll, you'll hear arguments with, uh, with folks when they're building systems with crypto where they're like, we should use a 128-bit key. No, it needs to be a 256-bit key. And kind of going back and forth with this, and they're uh, not really paying attention to the fact that they're, th the system has like trivial like cross-site scripting or some other bug into it. Uh, and they're like, so they're standing around arguing over how thick this door needs to be. So uh, if there's one thing you take away from this whole presentation, uh, besides that, you know, oh, oh boy, everything's on fire, uh, is that uh, if you're gonna be sending data in transit, this is data going across a network, uh, use TLS, we used to call it SSL, but SSL, we don't, we don't call it that anymore because that's the old thing, TLS is the new thing. Uh, Use TLS, SSH, or some kind of VPN, and uh, if you are just sending data, if you could do that, and if you can work it into that, great. Uh, if the data is gonna be sitting at rest, uh, try to use uh, GPG to, to encrypt it and have it sit at rest. At rest means like it's sitting on a hard disk, it's sitting in S3, it's sitting in you know, somewhere. Uh, and if your model doesn't fit into one of these two, see if you can rework it until it does because uh, you'll save yourself a lot of pain by being able to do one of these things. My general advice is always to avoid low-level libraries. Uh, libraries like OpenSSL, uh, PyCrypto, Bouncy Castle. Uh, I tend to describe these like I'm giving a developer a bucket full of razor blades and I'm asking them to build me a saw. Uh, <laughs> it's very easy to take these razor blades and misassemble them and hurt yourself. Uh, using a high-level library, you'll often, uh, you can still make missteps, but often a lot of these edges have been smoothed over for you. Something like uh, libsodium or salt in ACL, uh, which has bindings into uh, C, Ruby, Python, most, of, you know, most languages you would use, or uh, Google released a, a library called Keysar in Python and Java, and I think now also C++. Uh, so these, these high-level libraries kind of abstract over um, a lot of the mistakes that are commonly made and uh, hopefully take some of the edges off. So I promised pitfalls. Uh, so let's talk about some pitfalls in places where crypto goes wrong. All right, so first up is uh, random number generators. Uh, Randomness is a central part of any crypto system. It's used to generate things like encryption keys, API keys, you know, session tokens, all these various things are required to be what we think of as cryptographically secure. 
Uh, otherwise, an attacker can try to guess them, uh, which would end up being bad. So the first pitfall I want to talk about is not using a cryptographically secure random number generator. Uh, so there was a paper, uh, this was at the Usenix conference a few years ago, called I Forgot Your Password, which uh, was about randomness attacks against PHP applications. Uh, what, this one, what they did is they were actually able to successfully, uh, because these applications were just using like the built-in Mersenne Twister algorithm in PHP uh, to generate these password reset tokens, uh, they were able to, through some work, figure out what the password reset token for a user would be as it's been generated and emailed to the user so that they could reset their password before the user acted on the email. And the reason uh, they were able to do this is because uh, if you're not using a cryptographically strong number generator, uh, if you're looking at this more face on, you'll have a better view of it than if you're off of the side like I am. But the one on the left, there's a very clear pattern. There's a period as to how the data kind of repeats, which is not what you want in your random number generator. There should be no pattern. Uh, the one on the left was, was I made that image under the worst possible, possible circumstances. It was like Windows NT, PHP, very old PHP, uh, and it had just this really bad algorithm. The one on the right uh, is some crypt, you know, cryptographically random uh, noise, and let's just kind of to compare and contrast. The next one, using broker and random number generators. All right, uh, a few years ago, uh, so this is in the you know, late 2000s, 2008, uh, it was discovered that Debian uh, had for a number of years shipped a broken random number generator in OpenSSL. So they had patched OpenSSL, uh, and in it, they broke it. And this went, ended up going downstream to things, everything based on Debian, like Ubuntu and um, all those packages. And they all picked up their, pa their patches and were similarly broken. Uh, from about 2006 to 2008. Uh, and what it was is it was this line. So this is a line of C code in OpenSSL. And this line mixed in uh, random data from the system. And it was commented out in two places. Uh, and it was not discovered until 2008. And for those two years, if you used a system where this line was commented out, the, your random data was, was hopelessly broken. Uh, There's only about 15 bits of entropy that would have been present in the random number generator, which you can exhaust very quickly. Uh, and this kind of goes to show that, um, unfortunately, in many cases, good crypto looks a lot like bad crypto, and so you don't always know which one you're getting. Uh, the message when the person committed this was, uh, don't add initialized data to the random number generator to stop Valgrind from giving an error message. Uh, Valgrind, if you're not familiar, is you know, the C memory leak analyzer. And uh, they, really, they did this to like, squash uh, like a debug warning uh, or like a build warning for Valgrind. And uh, they ran it by the OpenSSL mailing list, which is the scary thing. And no one like, jumped at them and said, oh my god, no. Uh, so subsequently, every SSL certificate, SSH key generated using these, um, using on these systems were just broken. They needed to be replaced. So I went back and looked. This is that line today. There's a gigantic comment uh, letting you know that it's a bad idea to touch this line. So that's one way to solve this problem. Uh, but this, this problem of using broken random number generators has, you know, it's happened quite a bit. Uh, so this was uh, the Android. Android phones had a broken random number generator for a while. And how it was discovered was folks using Bitcoin apps on their phone started to notice their Bitcoins were being stolen. Uh, and so they, you know, they eventually did some investigation. They found out that the random number generator shipped with the system was broken. Uh, and that's how it manifested itself. Uh, this was just uh, in December of, of this last year. It was discovered that uh, Juniper had uh, been shipping ECDSA, uh, or sorry, not, I'm sorry, Dual EC, uh, a random number generator based on Dual EC in their systems, and not really being very public about it. You may remember Dual EC because that came out in the student papers as, uh, hey, we think that there's a you know, there's something here uh, that the NSA is exploiting. Uh, and this was actually known long before the Snowden papers. There was 
uh, these two folks who work at Microsoft gave a presentation at a conference on the possibility that this could be backdoored. Uh, and so Juniper had to kind of come out and be like, hey, we ship this random number generator and these products. We don't know where this, we don't know, really know where the code came from, and we don't know where the parameters to it came from, more importantly. Uh, so that, they, there was a lot of uh, consternation and investigation about that. And then the last one, uh, not using random data when it is required. All right, uh, so the Sony PS3 was using uh, elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, the ECDSA, uh, which is a variant of the, you know, the government's digital signature algorithm standard. Uh, and one thing the, to know about uh, ECDSA is it requires a parameter called K that must be uniformly random every time you sign, use the signature. And if it's not, uh, with, by observing a few signatures, you uh, can break it and you can get the private key uh, that was used to do the signature. So uh, they were not using random value K. In fact, it, I believe it was a static value that was just hard coded. Uh, and people eventually figured this out and they used it to I, probably like load uh, homebrew apps on their PS3s. So now comes the recommendations. So if you're using a Unix-like system, so this would be Unix, BSD, or like Linux, BSD, uh, read your random data from dev, you random. Open it as a file, read the amount of data you need, close the file, move on, and keep doing that whenever you need random data. There's a lot of discussions and arguments and going back and forth about this. Uh, I'm, a, I'm in the camp of just read devu random, use a wrapper that reads devu random, just use that, don't worry, or like don't kind of spend your time with the other stuff. If you happen to be on Windows, uh, in your .NET, there's a random number generator create, there's script gen random, uh, pick whichever one is for your operating system, uh, but generally th those are my recommendations when folks come up and ask. Next I want to talk about uh, hash functions. So uh, hash functions um, are often also called a fingerprint. Uh, and so like fingerprints, uh, no two things should have uh, the same fingerprint. Uh, it's one way, meaning it's not reversible. Uh, if you just you know, come up and look at one of my fingerprints, you wouldn't happen to know that it was mine unless you had some fingerprint database. Uh, and ideally, no two people have the same fingerprint. So for hash functions, uh, we're finding still in systems uh, folks using older, weak algorithms. Uh, so this was uh, in 2008, uh, MD5 considered harmful today. Uh, this paper was the one, this is where they used uh, a whole like, cluster of PS3s to uh, generate a certificate that uh, matched the same signature as one that was going to be signed by a CA. So they were basically able to uh, get a, you know, a CA certificate signed by a legitimate CA due to flaws in the MD5 uh, signing algorithm, or the MD5 hashing algorithm. And this really catalyzed the CA, the certificate authority industry, to just drop MD5 um, like a hot mess on the floor, uh, which people have been trying to do for a while, and it had been very slow. Uh, this one, uh, so this crypto breakthrough shows Flame was designed by world-class scientists. Uh, if you don't remember, Flame was one of the, you know, it was kind of came out around the time of like Stuxnet and was a piece of malware that was discovered. Um, and I believe it was in um, I Iranian nuclear facilities that had uh, started messing with their industrial controllers for their um, centrifuges. And uh, in it, there was a breakthrough in MD5 which had previously not been known. Uh, and they used that to bypass the Microsoft Windows Update facility and have the program appear like it was a legitimately signed program. This is why um, folks kind of look at Flame and they're like, well, clearly this has like intelligence community like NSA, uh, Mossad, you know, someone uh, worked on this. For a, uh, a more recent example, Free Start Collisions in, in Full Shot 1. So there's this move right now. Uh, and it has been for a little over a year, to get off of SHA-1 certificates in, uh, on our SSL for our websites. And the browsers have been move, moving very aggressively on this. The end date to buy one was December 31st. Uh, there have been a couple instances where folks have kind of broken down and been like, oh, we missed the deadline, we're, we're gonna break things. Uh, but this paper was one of the ones that kind of helped continue to catalyze this forward that SHA-1's, you know, although not broken, it's kind of the writing is on the wall that you need to be moving systems away from it. Uh, so th this is uh, 
This is an interesting uh, aside about hashing algorithms. So this is the logo for US Cyber Command. Uh, US Cyber Command must love hashing algorithms so much that the inner gold ring here has a, a hash in it. And if you look at it, it's this, which it's like, OK. Uh, turns out that is running MD5 on their mission statement. Uh, <laughs> And this was, this was way past the, when they should have used MD5, but like, it was sort of like, it was an interesting like, uh, aesthetic, I guess. All right, misunderstanding checksums. So we often use hashing algorithms as uh, checksums on files, so when we download them, we know that nothing got corrupted. So that's the SHA-1, SHA-256 sums file. The misconception here is that when you download and check these, that the assumption is, ah, this software hasn't been modified. And it's not that the software hasn't been modified, it's that your download didn't get corrupted. Uh, someone could have clearly just modified these tarball files and then also updated the SHA-1 sums file. And like, unless there's like some kind of GPG signature or something on them, you wouldn't, you'd be none the wiser. Uh, and that's just, I just want to make sure folks like draw that dichotomy and don't make that assumption. All right. Uh, the last one is a length extension attack. So uh, bear with me, because this is where we're going to get a little technical. Uh, length extension attacks exist when you use an algorithm uh, like SHA-1 or SHA-256 like this. Uh, so we have a secret value. This is like a uh, key. We have a value, and we just kind of append them, and we take the SHA-256 hash of it, and we call that our signature. And you know, we kind of assume that if both sides can do this, and they have the key, or they have the secret, then they, you know, they must know the secret, and that's how we can validate that the value hasn't been modified. So unfortunately, all of our, uh, our current generation of hash algorithms um, are all broken in such a way that that is not true. Uh, and they're broken because of just like a under, you know, basic fundamental of how they're built that you can actually arbitrarily append data at the end if you've observed the signature and the signed value and like the kind of the value, you can, you can append arbitrarily data at the end after some garbage uh, and recompute the new signature on the full thing. So this is called a length extension attack. Uh, and this, this could be bad news if you've built a system that has relied on this not, you know, this not being here. Uh, this was why when the, they announced the SHA-3 competition, they said that your algorithm had to be secure against this, like it couldn't allow this. The way you should be doing this is there's uh, an algorithm called HMAC, which takes a hash algorithm and use it to build an actual uh, message authentication code. Message authentication code is just a fancy way of saying if two parties share a secret, uh, they can produce a signature or something called a tag on a value that basically says this value hasn't been modified in transit, uh, and we know that because we can use this algorithm with this secret. Um, so unfortunately, no one told this to Flickr. Uh, this was 2009. Uh, so Flickr's API had this, uh, this length extension attack vulnerability, uh, and they ended up having to go back and fix this. Uh, so fortunately, this was 2009. This was like before maybe they should have known. Um, so this was from February 2016. Uh, Visa released a new payments API uh, where they were doing this exact same thing. Uh, so people brought it up. Uh, and now if you go back and you look at the documentation, this has been fixed. But this kind of goes to show you like we're still making these mistakes. So recommendations, uh, if you need a hash function, you know, you just need something to compute uh, a checksum or a fingerprint, use SHA-256. It's suitably fast. It's good for right now. Uh, if you need a signature, use HMAC SHA-256 if you want to share something that is a signature related on a shared secret. Stop using MD5. Uh, don't use SHA-1 uh, in new projects. And you might be time to start looking at uh, project plans to get SHA-1 out of your existing projects. All right, now on to everybody's favorite topic. This would not be a crypto uh, hairs on fire talk if we did not talk about password storage. So uh, it turns out, and I really missed an opportunity to update this, uh, it turns out organizations will uh, sometimes not do a very good job storing their passwords, and then those password databases get out. So LinkedIn uh, had 8 million, and then this very recently, like in the last week, it was found out to be a whole, whole lot more. Uh, so they, ha they leaked a bunch of passwords. Uh, Last.fm2, there's Yahoo, Dropbox, eBay, Slack. And I'm missing like tons and tons in here. But this is more to illustrate a point. 
And, and in some of those cases, but not in all of them, this was how they were storing their password. So they were taking the SHA-1 of the password and they were putting it in the database. So that's not good. So it does have one desirable property, and that is the value is one way. Uh, it can only be used as a verification. If I have a developer who has access to the database, uh, they, they can look at this and they're not just staring at passwords. So that's great. That, that actually is beneficial. Um, many of them were doing this, which is they were taking the SHA-1 of a some value that was randomized called assault and the password, and they were storing that in the database. Uh, this is like Unix circa like 1970 like uh, style security here. So they had this in the 70s. And uh, this is beneficial, you know, there's a randomized value in here. It can defeat these pre-computed tables called rainbow tables, which is another buzzword in the, in a, for a crypto talk. Uh, and it forces an attacker to focus on one password. There still is a problem with the, that, though. And that is hash functions are designed to be very, very, very fast. Uh, like billions of hashes a second on a modern GPU fast. And that's because it's used as the underlying part of all of our other algorithms, like uh, SSL and TLS and things like that. We want those to be fast. Uh, so what you want here is you want one way randomized and somehow adaptively slow. Uh, and for that, uh, there, we would use adaptive hashing. Uh, so there's bcrypt, scrypt, and then there's another algorithm called pbkdf2, or password-based key derivation function, too. I say that 10 times fast. Uh, so use one of these. It doesn't really, to me, it doesn't really matter which one. Uh, there, there's other ones that have just come out called, you know, there's one called argon. These are kind of like the staples for today. Uh, if you can, delegate your authentication. So if I'm going to comment on your blog, I don't need to create a username and password just to comment on your blog. Let me log in with like GitHub or something uh, so that you know, I can comment and you don't need to take a password. Uh, if you do need to take a password, like I don't know if you're building a payment gateway, uh, then store one-way verifiers using one of these algorithms uh, and then also make sure that you're tuning the algorithm to be as slow as you need it for your uh, your systems. All right, so some of you in the audience may be freaking out a little bit because you're like, oh, I know our systems do SHA-1 and we don't have this, and oh my God. Uh, so it'll be okay. You can fix it. Uh, so the naive case that we often come up with is, uh, so we have a password hash column that is SHA-1 of some salt appended with the password. And what developers will instinctively say is, ah, I will live migrate these when they log in again. And that, that's great, uh, except for you may notice that your long tail of logins will last a very, you know, a very, very long time. In fact, some users may never come back to your system. Don't they deserve password security too? Uh, and so uh, don't wait for the user to log in and just silently upgrade. My recommendation, uh, and I've written a blog post about this, uh, wrap bcrypt around the existing scheme. So your, your password storage becomes bcrypt of SHA-1, of the salt, and then upgrade all, all the passwords in the database. Uh, so this does require that your previous password scheme wasn't like really bad, like Descrypt bad is like, it truncates the passwords to eight characters. Uh, so now your password hash column is bcrypt of this, and you've upgraded them all, and when your password database leaks, you can be, ah, we use bcrypt, and hopefully folks will feel better about that, and your investors won't get upset. All right, let's, let's talk about ciphers for a little bit. Uh, once again, using older weak algorithms and ciphers, uh, for ciphers. Uh, this was a paper from a long time, this was, I think, early 2000s, if not late 90s. Uh, so this was back when DES, the digital encryption standard, was all the rage, and this was the federal government standard before AES, uh, and it eventually got to the point where it was almost trivial to break this. Uh, and there was this project and paper called Copacabana, which was, you know, hey, for less than $10,000, you could build a system that could break DES in a very reasonable amount of time. Today, it's even less, like, your Amazon bill, would, you know, would probably not be too much to break DES by yourself. And the unfortunate thing is, there are still systems out there that have DES in them. There are still people who will build new systems that use DES. Uh, I'm not talking about triple DES, I'm talking about just, like, kind of the plain old digital encryption standard. Uh, and that's, that's scary. 
Um, this is another one. So we've known for a very, very long time that RC4 has flaws. It has a lot of flaws. It's kind of, it's a very elegant algorithm if you've ever kind of looked at it, um, but it has biases and there's, you know, kind of all kinds of issues. And yet RC4 is still used for a lot of websites. It's still used on a lot, in a lot of TLS sessions. Um, there is an attack and a movement called RC4 No More uh, that is trying to get uh, websites to stop using RC4. Uh, and I encourage you to go back and if you're, you know, if your servers are still using RC4, you really should be finding an alternative. There are many other good ones in TLS to use. All right, next up, using ECB mode for block ciphers. Uh, to, first, we'll, we'll need to do a quick refresher on what AES is. Uh, so AES is a block cipher. It ha it's a pair of functions, an encrypt function and a decrypt function. Uh, it, those take two values. The first one is a key, which comes in three flavors per the, the requirements. Uh, and the second value is this either plain text or cipher text, which is 128 bits, period. That's the block size, it's called the block size, and that's all AES will do. So you pass one in, you get out the cipher text, you pass on the cipher text, you get out the plain text. That's great. But what if my data is longer than 128 bits? Uh, so trivially, what most uh, would come to is, oh, we'll just break this up into 16, uh, 16 byte or 120 bit chunks and just encrypt one at a time. Uh, and so the industry is way ahead of you. This is called ECB or electronic code book. The problem with this is that if there's any kind of structure in the data you're encrypting, that structure is going to shine through. Uh, so here is the Braintree logo, and then it, here it is encrypted using ECB. Uh, so the structure clearly is shown through. If you don't think your document has structure, you're probably wrong. A lot of documents have structure. Uh, so what you ideally want is at the bottom where it just like looks like random garbage. Uh, so if you, this is kind of kind of demonstrate if you see the word ECB. And unfortunately, it's the default in many cases in your system. You could be potentially leaving something in there that you don't realize. So the last one uh, in this, not using authenticated encryption. So uh, it has been shown and proven now that, uh, you remember at the beginning we had confidentiality and integrity? Uh, it's now been shown that if you don't have integrity, you will lose confidentiality. So this, that's what authenticated encryption is. That is saying that when I transmit a value, the other end needs to not be needs to be able to validate the integrity and then decrypt it. And if they can't do that, uh, then there will be there will be issues and there will be vulnerabilities that will allow the value to be modified or you know some other bad similarly bad thing. So uh, padding oracle attacks are very old news. So this this paper was in 2010, but the original thing about padding oracle is in was from 2002 uh, from Vodne. Uh, the, these folks went on to do what the beast vulnerability in TLS based on this, and then later on Poodle, that's what Poodle stands for, padding oracle. Uh, so the, these are practical attacks. Uh, and the, the other thing is you could build authenticated encryption into your system, but you could build it wrong like they did originally in TLS. And, uh, you know, TLS kind of grew up in this dark ages where we didn't have a lot of, re you know, solid research into crypto. Uh, at least the amount that we do now, and they unfortunately built the signature, so it is authenticated, but they built it backwards. They sign it, and then they encrypt it, and they need to encrypt it and then sign it. Uh, and so that has allowed a bunch of different attacks. One of them uh, was called Lucky 13, because there's, uh, there was timing differences in the code, and that leaked information, and so you were then able to use that to have a vulnerability. There was one more recently called Lucky Minus 21, which is this code that they thought was timing uh, complete later got modified and it was now once again timing sensitive and left uh, had issues. Apple very recently had an issue uh, in iMessages where they didn't they didn't validate they didn't have integrity on top of their ciphertext for I believe these were uh, like SMS attachments in iMessage. Uh, so there there was a paper from the John Hopkins University, or a couple of folks led by John Hopkins University uh, that kind of talked about this. They called it Dancing on the Lip of the Volcano, which is chosen ciphertext attacks in Apple iMessage. Uh, so this is another practical case very recently of a system being built that didn't have authenticated encryption in it, and uh, it was subsequently broken. 
And I, I don't really always blame the developers because they're really, we're in a world of hurt. Uh, so behind this is an image of the PyCrypto documentation, which has, uh, gives you this like litany of options, one of which is ECB mode, and then you know, it doesn't really give you any kind of information about like which is secure, what will be causing a problem. Do you, you know, it doesn't tell you anything about protecting uh, the integrity. And then the example at the top, which I know you can't, you can't see this, uh, uses um, CFB mode, which is cipher feedback mode, which nobody uses. Like that's like one of those things where it's like, yeah, it exists and it's described in Wikipedia, but very few systems actually use that. And like, why is that your example at the top? Like your example at the top should be a practical example that folks can copy and then use. So my recommendation here, uh, prefer the box, secret box from uh, Libsodium, stop using DES, uh, stop building your own on top of AES, uh, stop building encryption without protectivity. Uh, what if you have to use AES? So occasionally folks will be like, I'm in an industry where I have to use AES. Uh, so my recommendation there, don't use ECB. Uh, you have to use authenticated encryption, so GCM mode, uh, even then, you have to verify the tag or the Mac first. There's like all kinds of other stuff that you know will cause an issue. It can go wrong, is all I'm saying. So, good luck. TLS SSL verification. So, uh, there was a paper, the most dangerous code in the world, which uh, talked about non-browsers doing TLS. Uh, these are like mobile apps and server-side apps. And what they found is that they were not really upholding the two kind of things you must do in TLS very well. Uh, so the first one is they were not, some of them were not verifying the certificate chain. Uh, and if you never seen, don't know what a certificate chain is, this is what it is, this thing at the top where it's like VeriSign is a root that's on your system, chains to this, chains to this. This is a chain of trust. You know, these are protected with digital signatures all the way down to the websites. Uh, so if you don't validate the certificate chain, you can just give them anything and they'll think it's a valid website. Uh, and so, you know, someone can sit in the middle, intercept your traffic, uh, and present you with a completely, uh, you know, fake certificate, and you'll happily send your traffic to them, which is not great if you're thinking of, like, a mobile banking application. So what would this look like in code or in command line? So curl has this flag called dash K, which will basically turn off uh, TLS verification. If you're using curl, and this is like a PHP code, you can say verify peer equal, you know, set it to zero, Verify peer means I, I don't want to actually verify who I'm talking to. That seems like a bad thing to turn off. The second one that they found in a lot of cases is they were not verifying the host name of the other party. So if you don't verify the host name of the other party, they could present any valid certificate. Like I could present my certificate for jtdowney.com, my blog, and you think you're going to PayPal and you're your mobile phone or whatever system would just accept it because it's a valid certificate, but they don't actually check who that certificate was issued for. Um, and so there, there, there are problems here. So hostname verification is protocol independent, meaning like HTTP is different from SMTP, is different from all the other systems. And so thusly, OpenSSL doesn't have it built in. Uh, so each system has to kind of do it itself, like libcurl does it. Uh, so each so if you have an HTTP library just sitting on OpenSSL, if you haven't done your own H uh, hosting verification, you're probably not doing it. And Rust actually just found this out. And like Hyper, the really popular uh, HTTP library in Rust was not doing host hosting verification. Uh, so uh, also some people just, you can turn it off. Verify host, false, uh, not good. Next, using a broken library. Uh, hopefully by now we've all heard about Heartbleed. Uh, this was another one. This, uh, this was an Apple. This was the go-to fail, where they, you know, it was because of issues in C code that it just skipped over uh, the handshake verification. Uh, so this is another case where these libraries were just broken. And some, I guarantee you there's a server out there that's still vulnerable to Heartbleed. So ensure you're validating connections. Lean on your library or framework uh, whenever possible. Uh, set up automated testing, my recommendation. So you can look at badssl.com for examples of how they do it. If you have no idea what to set your server settings for TLS for, Mozilla has a great like generator, like I'm using Nginx, I'm using this, I'm using this, and they'll just drop configs out for you to copy. Uh, so you can get my slides later. Uh, last up, let's talk about trust. Uh, so raise your hand if you've seen this before. 
Okay, now keep your hand up if you validated the fingerprints before you actually type yes. All right. So uh, SSH, unlike TLS, uses a trust model called Tofu or trust on first use. So this is, this is SS, SSH saying, you validate first time, I will mathematically guarantee that you're only talking to the same person after that. Uh, so if you type yes here, you're telling SSH that uh, you, you've upheld your part of the bargain. Later on, the, that other host gets reinstalled or something else pops up, and this is SSH saying, whoa, you said that that was the thing, now it's not the thing anymore. Uh, and if you read a blog post about this, it's usually just gonna tell you to like RM the known host file, which is not great. <laughs> All right, next up, so this is Mozilla's list of included CA certificates by default. Uh, I just kind of scrolled through the list and took a capture. Uh, so I would ask you to think, like, do you trust all of these companies? Do you trust their hiring practices, their, fire, you know, their termination practices, their auditing practices, all these things? Uh, because you implicitly trust each and every one of these in Firefox. Uh, and there are companies, there's Government of the Netherlands, Hong Kong Post Office, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, you know, there, there's all kinds of organizations up here. Uh, and so the last, one of the last things I want to talk about is certificate pinning. Uh, so certificate pinning lets you uh, kind of say, it lets you get around this trust model a little bit and that you can kind of say, only trust these certificates in this chain. So if, I ha if I'm serving up one of these, it's okay. And you can kind of signal to the endpoint device to only kind of, uh, either you bundle in with it or you signal it to it later. And it'll remember that and it'll kind of fail the operation if someone later tries to, you know, someone signs a, uh, like DigiNoiter where they found the Iranian government had signed, you know, mailed at yahoo.com uh, illicitly. Uh, so this will help with things like that. There's a public key pending standard uh, for HTTP. It's still a little bit experimental under review, uh, but it's called HPKP. I definitely re recommend checking it out. Think about what organizations you really trust. Investigate certificate pending. All right. It is actually over. Uh, the last thing I want to say, check out Stanford's crypto class if you're interested in learning more. This is a free Coursera class. I highly recommend it. Unfortunately, there are no sessions listed for like the future things, so I would just subscribe uh, and wait for the next one. Uh, Masano, uh, which is now called NCC Group, released a set of crypto challenges. These are, you take some development, uh, the, these are developer challenges, so you kind of go, you like self-guide and they'll help you break a bunch of crypto stuff, so it's a lot of fun. That is it. Questions, follow me on Twitter if you're interested. I sometimes tweet about these things. Sometimes I tweet pictures of my cats, so. All right, I don't know if we, John, do we have any questions in the, that were submitted through the app? Otherwise, I'll take live questions, or you can all leave. No, we've just, um, just a, a question. Have you removed all traces of uh, OpenSSL from your systems? So the, the question was, have you removed all traces of OpenSSL from your systems? Uh, I will, so no, and I'll tell you why. So I, I think I may be a little bit different than some of the community in that I still, I still believe in OpenSSL, and I'll tell you why. Uh, so Google has forked it into boring SSL and have like tried to like feed things back. So it has Google kind of behind it. They're you know, backing it in for all their servers and in Chrome. They're kind of you know, sitting on OpenSSL as their foundation and trying to improve it. The LibreSSL folks uh, from the OpenBSD camp have like, kind of hard forked it and done a few things. So I think there, there is hope for it. Uh, the reason why I'm not so keen to like, just switch uh, is because if you do a survey of the landscape, uh, all, the, all the major uh, competitors of it, especially in the open source space, have all had very nasty vulnerabilities uh, in and around the time of Heartbleed. They've had the go-to fail was Apple's, but there were similar ones in new TLS. Uh, that's new as in the GNU organization. Uh, and then uh, Polar and a bunch of others. So I'm not so like, quick to drop OpenSSL. It is, uh, is the devil we know, and I think it's the devil we can like tame a little bit more. Uh, so yeah. All right. No other questions. All right. Thank you.